minister to get to know to get the government. Day in Australian politics with Julia Gillard challenging Kevin Rudd to become our next Prime Minister. Whichever way it goes, this is history in the making. The country woke to the bewildering news that the Prime Minister was on his way out. The big problem was that the people went to bed with one Prime Minister and woke up with another. The Labor Party, I think, has decided whack Julia in and they're certain to win the election. There was no democratic touchstone for her that legitimised her leadership. It was done in the dead of night. Factional leaders urged Julia Gillard to move against Kevin Rudd. You've got the factional heavies deciding the leader's got to go. It was sloppy because there was no factoring in of the electorate. Julia was damned from her first day in office. Labor MPs will be meeting at 9am in Parliament. A lot of numbers are being crunched this morning, a lot of careers being crunched. In one night, we took this amazing, talented politician in Julia Gillard, and we took her from the Lady in Waiting and made her Lady Macbeth, and she never, ever recovered from it. I always had this long shadow from the way in which I became Prime Minister and active steps were taken basically every day of my Prime Ministership to have that shadow become darker and darker, not lighter and lighter. Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd made their way to the caucus room. For the last time, as leader and deputy. It was supposed to be for a leadership vote. But the outcome had been determined the night before. A number of factional leaders within the Labor Party uh, no longer support my leadership. It's become apparent to me... In the... Kevin Rudd's support in the caucus just appeared to vanish. It just eked away. It was quite shocking. Kevin Rudd chose not to contest the ballot. He handed the Prime Ministership to Julia Gillard. Rudd was left to appeal to his natural constituency, the voters. I was elected by the Australian people uh, as Prime Minister of this country. I'm proud of the fact that we got rid of work choices. We started to build the national broadband network education revolution, reform the health system. We now have paid parental leave. I hope I've been able to uh, demonstrate to you uh, that um, <clears throat> this has been a very busy two and a half years. It was, you know, heartbreaking, absolutely, uh, lump in your throat material. And I'm most proud of the fact that uh, about here, uh, we greeted the stolen generations. What I remember most about it, for those of you who weren't here, was as the stolen generations came in from over there. They were frightened. I still hoped that after the shock, the immediacy of the hurt, that over time he would actually feel some of the relief that would come with having the burdens of office off his shoulders. Did you feel relieved? Uh, not at all, but I imagine that's the sort of thing an assassin does say. <laughs> I asked 
asked my colleagues to make a leadership change. A change because I believed that a good government was losing its way. I know the Rudd government did not do all it said it would do. At the end of the day, it didn't cut it, and we didn't think that would be appropriate on the day that he was going through so much anguish that we would go out there and dance uh, on top of him. And we didn't, but I think uh, uh, that was a mistake. The public theatre of Question Time would test all the principal actors. When I walked in, the eerie nature of the silence in the chamber really struck me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this morning I was elected as leader of the Parliamentary Labor Party. Kevin Rudd sat on the back bench, unable to conceal his emotions. I accept that the government has lost track. We will get back on track. I have taken control for precisely that purpose. The former Prime Minister... Rudd had announced in his press conference he planned to stay in Parliament. The gratitude and respect... I thought it would be best for him personally if he didn't contest the next election. ..in question time today. The assumption was that Kevin Rudd would just pull up stumps and leave Parliament. That just betrays a complete lack of understanding about Kevin Rudd. I, Julia Eileen Gillard, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will well and truly serve the Commonwealth of Australia. Julia Gillard was sworn in as Australia's first female Prime Minister. Minister. Meanwhile, negotiations over Rudd's future were underway. There was a very preliminary discussion as to whether Kevin would consider staying on in Cabinet. <laughs> Prior to um, the end of that day, Julia Gillard, uh, through her chief of staff, had asked my office to ask me whether I wished to serve in the cabinet of the government. I sent back a message saying yes. No, no offer was made. Certainly, I never authorised an offer to be made to Kevin. Kevin Rudd and his staff ended the day at the lodge. At the time, I remember there was a lot of very emotional people there and Kevin stood up and he said, we'll be back. That's how he opened his speech. He was in his early 50s, young, fit, mentally still very active. He was just not ready to leave the stage. I felt that night that none of us would ever be the same again. I knew that it would mean uh, for us inevitably that we'd be at some stage picking sides and that that would lead to great unhappiness. The first cabinet meeting of the Gillard government. The deliberate impression was back to business. We felt we'd avoided all the damage to the party that comes with a long and ugly leadership challenge. And now we could govern the way we believed the Labor government should. The question of Kevin Rudd's inclusion in Cabinet was unresolved. There was a strong view put by many people that he shouldn't uh, be around the Cabinet table. It would be too difficult. Kevin Rudd left the lodge for the last time. Julia Gillard had offered to bring him back into the cabinet after the election, but not in the role he wanted as foreign minister. I thought the best thing was for Kevin to take a bit of time out. Heaven knows he's earned it. The reality is, Julia Gillard, you wanted a break from him rather than him wanting a break from being a minister. Well, John, I think that's a, a fairly unkind remark. On day one, Gillard called a truce on the damaging war with the mining industry and began negotiations for a new version of the mining tax. Get off the agenda. 
That was our attitude. Just get it settled, get it off the agenda. Hours of talk with mining bosses and plenty of wine ended with both sides signing on the dotted line. The revised tax satisfied the powerful multinational miners. In the short term, it looked like a victory for the new Gillard government. Early internal polling done by the Labour Party after the leadership change showed the primary vote was up seven points. Asked to describe Julia Gillard in one word, the responses were varied. Strong, female, determined, but also backstabber, untrustworthy, traitor. Please welcome Prime Minister Julia Gillard. Questions about the machinations of the leadership change were beginning to emerge. Uh, thank you very much. I could see that Laurie Oakes was at one of the tables of journalists. So I knew as soon as Laurie was there that there was something up. I'm going to look back to the famous meeting in Kevin Rudd's office the night before you became Prime Minister. I didn't react uh, in any way. I didn't move. Is it true that Mr Rudd indicated to you that if closer to the election, polling showed that he was an impediment to the re-election of the government, that he would then voluntarily stand aside and hand over the leadership to you before the election? Is it also true that you agreed that this offer was sensible and responsible? Behind that fixed that posture, no obviously break, incredibly break, angry break, because it was clearly a leak from Kevin to Laurie designed to destroy this event. You said you'd changed your mind, you'd been informed. It was so bad for me because it was directly on character questions about how I had become Prime Minister. Did you give Laurie Oakes that account? It's entirely possible. Um, but just as it's possible that I spoke to a whole bunch of other journalists about it, um, Julia Gillard marches in and launches a leadership coup. Uh, and then suddenly there's supposed to be some veil of total secrecy surrounding a conversation with me. We went into that uh, discussion on the basis that it was a confidential discussion between colleagues and I intend to respect that confidence for the rest of my life. I'd taken a decision at the time that on all of these questions I was not going to unpack before the eyes of the public uh, all of the things, the chaos that had built you up. Didn't, you didn't have to unpack all oh, of the no, chaos. I, I, I mean, I the question of what happened in that room is not a complex one. No, I, I, I absolutely disagree with that. Um, I was very conscious that if you put even your toe on this very sticky piece of paper, then you would be caught on it. Is it true that there was then a, a brief break during which... Mr. I think Rudd Julia's always had a, a bit of a problem with the truth. Julia is such a disciplined political player that she has almost in her mind a scripted answer to any question that you ever put to her. Julia Gillard called the election. Today I seek a mandate from the Australian people to move Australia forward. <laughs> How do we run a campaign now with Julia after she said that this was a dysfunctional government and that the uh, the Prime Minister had to go? You look so beautiful. You are. Because she had decided to get rid of Kevin, it was difficult, she felt, for her to talk about the success of 2007-2010 was principal about the economy. Gillard reached out to Tony Blair's campaign strategist, former British Cabinet Minister, Alan Milburn. Julia rang me up asking me to go out because the campaign was going really badly, and it was. Labour was losing, not winning. And my assessment of the campaign was that we'd made every mistake that was possible. Yeah, I'm the handsome part of that. Kevin Rudd was campaigning in his own seat in Queensland. Uh, that lies properly with the province of others. Any journalist he's spoken to in the last 15 years is on the phone. They're calling him, they're calling me, they're calling the office. And there is no way to meet that appetite. People want Kevin's stories. Ten days into the campaign, a 
Cabinet leak through Gillard further off course. Good evening. Prime Minister Julia Gillard has been embarrassed tonight by revelations that she opposed paid parental leave when it was considered by Cabinet. Ms Gillard also expressed reservations about last year's big pension increase. An attempt to have a go at her because of her single status, that she mightn't appreciate uh, the importance of paid parental leave. I mean, paid parental leave and fixing up the base rate of the age pension with the very core of our labour values. I thought this was, you know, the election losing moment. That basically the election could not be won from here. Well, PM, you know this information didn't come from the Liberals. You'll need to look a lot closer to home. Laurie Oakes, Nine News. As we worked our way through both the pension increase and the pay parental leave scheme, I looked at them from every angle. We are talking about expenditure. I knew instantaneously that, A, Laurie Oakes has got a story. He's got a, a highly credible source. And my view was there could only be one highly credible source that he could have spoken to, and that was Kevin. Well, I've always thought it was Kevin Rudd. Why so sure? It couldn't have been anybody else. There is nothing that should lead you to expect, uh, you know, bastardry of that magnitude. You know, hard things happen. Hard thing happened to Malcolm Turnbull. A hard thing happened to Bob Hawke. A hard thing happened to Kim Beasley. A hard thing happened to Kevin Rudd. A hard thing happened to me. You can still make choices about how you conduct yourself. Were you responsible for providing that information to Absolutely the journalists? Absolutely not. Is it truthful to say that you didn't leak against Julia Gillard during the campaign? It's absolutely truthful. They tried to get on with the job of campaigning. Julia Gillard spent much of the day fighting against her own side. She can't escape the ghost of Kevin Rudd. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Ah. It was made perfectly clear to me that the only way to stop the leaks was to give Kevin what he wanted. How was that made clear to you? Uh, it was made clear uh, to me in a set of discussions that were going back and forth with John Faulkner as the intermediary. Well, that's utterly false. Uh, John Faulkner never spoke to me about uh, any allegation of culpability concerning me or anybody else. The leak stopped. Well, you assume on a continuing basis in, in your questions uh, that, uh, that a single person... Uh, me or somebody else was responsible for them. And there are 20 or 30 other people in the room and stacks apart from that who would have known precisely what Julia's position was. Whatever the negotiations were behind the scenes, Kevin Rudd was promised the foreign ministry if they won the election. Party elder John Faulkner insisted Rudd and Gillard stage a joint event. The next blows were self-inflicted. In a newspaper interview, Julia Gillard announced the campaign would now reveal the real Julia. If the real Julia Gillard is standing up today, why have you been faking it for the last two weeks? <laughs> And I felt like I wanted to, you know, shake it up a bit, to uh, you know, have a re-engagement with the public. Well, you've been seeing uh, glimpses of me, but I'm going to make sure you see a whole lot more of me. Well, I thought that was evidence of her inexperience in, you know, political leadership and running a campaign. Prime Minister, no mention today. The single most damaging line in the long term drew little attention at the time. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. What we will do is we will tackle the challenge of climate change. We've invested record We dealt with uh, climate change policy quite early in the campaign, and that statement was in the reaction phase, and then, you know, were reacting as necessary when questions were put to me. Election night at the end of a lacklustre campaign. The contrast with Labor's victory in 2007 could hardly have been more stark. That night, the convention centre was absolutely dead. It was perhaps a third full. There was a feeling of a very, very poorly attended funeral. 
Well, this could get down to one or two seats tonight. The figure I've got in the computer at the moment is saying Labor 75 seats, which is a dead heat. Julia Gillard. <laughs> Labor lost 13 seats. Neither side had a clear majority. find ourselves tonight. Obviously, this is too close to call. The independent MPs in Parliament now held the balance of power, uh, including three out. former nationals, yeah. Rob Oakeshott and Tony yeah. Windsor, Welcome, and the mercurial Bob yeah. Catter. The history of this is told now wrongly, as if it was always inevitable that I was going to form government. That wasn't the truth. She was more capable of doing the job. Her background, her capacity to negotiate uh, was obvious. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. First step in the numbers game was the deal that became known as the Labor Green Alliance. Congratulations, Good thank you. <laughs> I equalised the seat tally by doing the early agreement with the Greens. Thank you. It played into the narrative, which is dangerous for Labor, that the Greens are somehow an extension of Labor. The following day, Gillard won over Tasmanian independent Andrew Wilkie. Okay, okay. How are you, mate? Good right. to see you. The momentum was turning against Abbott. <laughs> So they're all asking if you're abstaining. On a wild day in Parliament House, Tony Windsor and Rob Oakeshott finally decided to back Julia Gillard. This is going to be a cracking Parliament. You know, there's going to be, it's going to be ugly, uh, but it's going to be beautiful in its ugliness. <laughs> Julia Gillard's minority government was sworn in. Minister for Social Housing and Homelessness. And there were Minister promotions for the men who managed the leadership coup. I, Mark Victor Arbib. Mark Arbib, Don Farrell, David Feeney and Bill Shorten. Well, I pick people on uh, merit, but the people you're talking about, Mark Arbib, Bill Shorten, for example, these are people of real political merit, policy merit. I'd worked with Mark, I thought Mark was a person with real capacity and clearly I've got a very favourable view of Bill Shorten's capacities. Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of State, give him a warm welcome. At the back of the room in the victorious caucus, the new Foreign Minister joined in the applause. Was he always coming back? How deep was his drive to be vindicated? Almost immeasurable. I don't think Bruce uh, necessarily understands what motivates me. I'm fairly private about those things. My desire uh, was to be able to serve as foreign minister without getting in the road of people domestically. Determined to price carbon. In the new year, the government and their partners, the Greens, appeared together for an announcement on carbon pricing. Now, this proposed mechanism for pricing carbon is agreed to by the Australian government and by the Australian Greens. History tells us. In the Rudd government, Julia Gillard had argued forcefully to drop the emissions trading scheme. Now she proposed a scheme of her own. Prime Minister, on the eve of the last election, you said there'd be no carbon tax. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. Were you wrong to say that? And what's changed your mind? The Australian people voted for this parliament, and this parliament gives us an opportunity to price carbon. And we should. It's the right time to do it. It started with a fixed carbon price for at least three years. Craig Emerson warned her not to call it a tax. I said after the election you must not concede that you are pressing ahead with a carbon tax. Don't call this one a carbon tax because you will be seen to have broken a promise. And the response I got was we're not going to uh, get drawn into a game of semantics here. With this carbon tax, do you do concede it's a carbon tax, do you not? 
Oh, look, uh, I'm happy to use the word tax, Heather. I understand some uh, silly little collateral debate has uh, broken out today. I mean, how ridiculous. You're not the people with the big checkbooks. I understand now, looking back on it, how foolish it looks. We lost control of that debate. We should have more vigorously contested its characterisation as a carbon tax. We don't deserve that! No! The concession that we're implementing a carbon tax and then the playing to the community of the election commitment that there'd be no carbon tax, that did cut through the community within 24 hours like a scalpel. What do we want? No carbon tax! Oh, that's good. No! The ALP's primary vote fell to 30, five points lower than the worst position under Kevin Rudd. All sorts of fruit loops came out of the dark corners of the country, and mixed up in that, I think, was misogyny. I think possibly it could read, if we were going to be politically correct, that Julia is Bob Brown's female dog. <laughs> Opposition leader Tony Abbott joined the demonstrators. If I look out on this crowd of fine Australians, I want to say that I do not see scientific heretics. I do not see environmental vandals. I see people who want honest government. I felt like vomiting when I saw the signs. And an intelligent response. Ditch the witch is bad enough. But dual liar Bob Brown's bitch is so deeply and utterly offensive. Deeply and utterly offensive to any woman in this country, let alone the Prime Minister of Australia. I really don't know why this wasn't a career ending moment for Tony Abbott. Sexism is no better than racism. Since this Prime Minister has come to office, we have had almost three boats a week. That's three boatloads of suffering humanity, three boatloads As Deputy of Prime Minister, Julia Gillard had criticised Kevin Rudd's handling of asylum seekers. Now she faced a series of crises of her own. My criticisms of Kevin were not only that he watched this political problem rise, he didn't go on a methodical search for a solution. Uh, I went on a methodical search for a solution. I think the sheer complexity confronted her and hit her between the eyeballs. Um, it's hard stuff out there. A boat carrying asylum seekers was dashed onto the rocks of Christmas Island, bringing the tragedies at sea closer to home. Which moral compass points you towards drowning as an acceptable outcome? Which moral compass lets you do that? I knew that the only thing that would work is something like returning people to where they would got on the boat via a proper agreement. And I knew that we'd just have to do whatever it took to get that agreement up. By August, an agreement was reached with the Malaysian government. A group of asylum seekers were readied for departure from Christmas Island. If you spend your money, you get on a boat, you risk your life, you don't get to stay. You go to Malaysia. The deal was that asylum seekers coming to Australia by boat would be sent directly to Malaysia. We got an agreement which nobody said we could get. The Liberal Party knew it would work. And uh, all the legal advice was, this was solid. This was a proper agreement. At the 11th hour, a high court injunction halted the transfer. Tonight, the government's asylum seeker swap with Malaysia has imploded. First East Timor, now Malaysia. Another so-called asylum seeker solution is no solution at all. The deal with Malaysia was effectively over. Let's make no bones about it. Today's decision by the High Court is a profoundly disappointing one. I think it was one of the biggest policy weaknesses of her time. You could not live with a situation where you had arrivals running at, at thousands a month. The carbon tax rallies rolled on. We cannot stop. 
boosted by the presence of politicians and broadcast celebrities calling on the Prime Minister to resign. Now, what we are saying really to Julia Gillard, to the Prime Minister, is a very simple message. Julia, go away. <laughs> go away, Julia. Get out of our lives, Julia. Ditch a witch! Ditch a witch! The language on Gillard in focus groups was really harsh. It was amazing that you could have, you know, six or seven strangers who didn't know each other in a room and Gillard would come up and would be full on and nasty and they were basically repeating what they were hearing from shock jocks and all those sorts of cheerleaders. Nasty, backstabbing and it always end in the word bitch. Good evening. And welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, the former Prime Minister, now Foreign Minister, Kevin Rudd. That's exactly what <laughs> In the midst of the attacks on Julia Gillard, Kevin Rudd went public for the first time, airing internal disagreements in his government over climate policy. ...that there were a diversity of views within the Labor Party at the time. <laughs> and, uh, and, and within the Cabinet. Uh, that wouldn't be stretching the truth too far. The, uh, and so you had some folk who wanted to get rid of it altogether. Uh, that is, kill the ETS as a future proposition for the country. I couldn't abide that. One of the consequences, said, of course, uh, of minority uh, government, when there was bad behaviour and Kevin uh, consistently danced right out on that line of bad behaviour, I couldn't do that much to discipline him because the nature of minority government is kind of everybody's got their hand on the grenade and anybody can pull the pin. The nature of the hung parliament meant that during that entire period, it was unstable. Uh, in terms of uh, the media and in terms of the perceptions. It was like living in two worlds because at the same time, the government and the parliament were actually functioning pretty well. Um, legislation was being passed. Today, Mr Chairman, marks the beginning of Australia's clean energy future. The passage through Parliament of the plain packaging legislation is a milestone moment. The government has passed a key part of its national broadband legislation after a marathon debate. The Parliament now having passed 250 pieces of legislation. Kevin Rudd, meanwhile, was making appearances in marginal seats. We all, from time to time, have media issues. Why did you do that? It looks like a provocative act. Because they invited me and because they were fearful of how they were going in the polls. Secondly, they knew that I had strong levels of support in the Australian community. It's got to be good to have Kevin, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. I'm very lucky. Yeah, yeah, I do. What Thanks, Kevin sir. was doing he was uh, calibrating his media performances uh, to distract attention from things that I was doing as Prime Minister. Uh, I think it's time people actually ask themselves this question. What objectively uh, did um, Julia get right and get wrong uh, on her own merits in that period of government? Uh, and then form a separate conclusion as to whether I was responsible for those errors. By now, Julia Gillard had already lost the support of one of her earliest backers in the leadership change. We made a mistake. The things that we sought to achieve by changing the leadership and in the manner that it was changed had been totally unproductive, counterproductive, she didn't have within herself the persona or the authority that is necessary to do that job. West Australian Senator Mark Bishop reached out to Rudd. He came back to me straight away and we set up a time and we had a talk in my office. I went back to Kevin's office uh, on one occasion uh, to have a talk to him. 
and um, expressed my concerns. I mean, I, I put the view to Kevin that I thought things were becoming untenable and in those circumstances that he should consider his position uh, with respect to the leadership. And what, what was his response? Coy. Coy. Uh, it's not unusual for candidates to at least appear to be coy, uh, even when you know they're red hot. Julia Gillard's first Labour Party conference as Prime Minister. The lead up to that conference was incredibly tense, was incredibly frenzied. Her backers knew the party's disastrous polls made the leader vulnerable. The Prime Minister of Australia, the Honourable Julia Gillard. It was a crucial moment for Gillard to stamp her authority on the party. All eyes were on Gillard's speech. There was some debate about whether or not Kevin should be mentioned in the list of Prime Ministers in that speech, and I remember Julia not being particularly keen on the idea. And we meet as a party which knows that the Labor way is the Australian way. The speech was drafted, uh, was looked at by a number of people, and no one uh, picked up, oh, you know, the media take on this will all be about Kevin. The responsibilities of government are the responsibilities of hard choice. Curtin knew that. Chifley knew that. Whitlam knew it. Hawke and Keating knew it. Every day they governed. And we know it now. We didn't mention every single Labour Prime Minister ever in the history of Australia. And we certainly did not deliberately omit the name of Kevin Rudd to prepare our nation for the future too. I was, uh, I was a bit hurt. Because it's a gathering of the party faithful. Because we had no opinions. We didn't come here. But more than that, I just thought it was politically dumb. Kevin Rudd supporters have been complaining all weekend that the current Prime Minister has been trying to airbrush the previous Prime Minister out of... The airbrushing of Kevin Rudd from history inflamed the tensions between the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister. What we chose to do was, first of all, to stimulate consumption. Media speculation of a leadership challenge gathered momentum. Well, it was absolutely terrible. I'd get into my office, you know, early. And here it is, front page splash, the Herald Sun, the Australian, the Daily. Now, forgive me, but they usually were news corporation papers. Um, you know, more shit on Labor, all provided by unnamed sources within Labor. And day after day after day, a vicious backgrounding by people from within our own government. That's deeply dispiriting. Very few people come to this with clean hands. Frankly, Kevin no, destabilised Julia. In my view, Julia destabilised Kevin and Kim Beasley. Uh, Wayne Swan destabilised Simon Crean. So what I did is what a range of colleagues have done at various times on various occasions to various leaders. I take no pride in it. I take no pride in it at all. Uh, however, do I think it was necessary in the circumstances? I do. Both sides briefed journalists. Uh, a group of journalists came round and then had an expansive uh, off-the-record discussion with me about how the government was going at their request. Uh, I was uh, full and frank with them about how I thought we were going, as I was full and frank with them that I'd be doing nothing about it. Certainly, I had to uh, take steps to try and answer all of this. So did I ask some of my good colleagues to uh, speak to journalists so that they got both sides of the story? Absolutely, I did that. Checking out the Australian newspaper online. It became clear that Kevin was planning on uh, mounting his challenge very shortly. 
during that uh, lead up to that weekend, uh, the gloves were off. It had to be brought to a head. Outbreaks of disunity are becoming more commonplace. Backbencher Darren Cheeseman's called on the Prime Minister to stand down. Mysteriously, uh, within an hour or two, there pops up uh, on uh, the Fairfax uh, site uh, a, a YouTube video. Oh, man, this is just impossible. Of uh, me swearing. Ah! There's fucking language. He's just complicates it so much, you know? How can anyone do this? The video, posted anonymously, was from 2009. The then Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, recording a message in Mandarin for an official function. Is this a fucking Chinese interpreter up there? Why was this tape stolen? Who released it? And perhaps Mr McTiernan could answer that question. Yeah, I was completely surprised. I fucked up the last word. And I thought, somebody really doesn't like Kevin. Welcome to the program. Can I start On his way to Washington, Rudd recorded an interview claiming he was a changed man. The bottom line is, I think you do learn. And what I've tried to learn from all of that is do less in a given working day rather than trying to do everything. I think it's uh, also important to delegate more. Simon Crean, Minister for the Arts, Regional Australia. My office spoke to Simon about doing an interview uh, and saying some things about Kevin, absolutely. Clearly he's not playing as part of the team and I think that conversation should happen. If he can't be part of the team, he should exit the team should or she? challenge. Having dispatched Crean to the airwaves, Gillard announced the release of David Gonski's report into school funding. And today we are publicly releasing that report, this, the Gonski Review. This was a set of reforms that I'd been patiently working my way towards, not only as Prime Minister, but as Deputy Prime Minister beforehand. And you've got all of this collateral just raining around. OK, are there any other further questions? Do you believe you'll be around by the end of this year as leader to see these reforms through? Yes, I do. Phil. Let the elevator go. Kevin was in the US. Bye. And it was almost certain that he was going to announce that he was uh, resigning as foreign minister. He was so incensed by the way he'd been treated, he felt he had no choice. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is with uh, great sadness that I announce that uh, I will resign as Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs. I have decided that at 10am Monday morning, a ballot for the Labor leadership will be conducted. It was time for a bit of truth-telling and I was prepared to go to areas that in the past I'd kept away from the public square and public stage. Ministers lined up to attack Rudd. Steve Gibbons is calling Kevin Rudd a psychopath with a giant ego. The stories that were around of the chaos, of the temperament, of the inability to have decisions made, they are not stories. Had contempt for the cabinet, contempt for the cabinet members, contempt for the caucus. Contempt I think for the we need parliament. to get out of this idea that Kevin is a messiah who will deliver an election back to us. That is just, I think, fanciful. So what was your plan? Was it to make sense of the original act or to stop him from trying another challenge, get rid of him for good? Uh, both of those things. The truth is that Prime Minister Rudd is deeply flawed. I was ready to go from the second that, that, it, that it came on. Mr Rudd was quite disloyal to the Labor movement, which put him in the parliament. I thought it was a very, very big call to, to make those views so public and to make them so transparent. Anthony Albanese made an impassioned plea to his colleagues. I have devoted... Uh, ..my life to advance in the cause of labour. I have despaired in recent days 
As I have watched Labor's legacy in government be devalued. I'd argued against this sort of action before. On the night of 23rd of June 2010, I believe the government's difficulties can be traced to that night. Albanese announced he would vote for Rudd in the ballot, knowing Rudd would lose. Julia Gillard won the ballot convincingly, 71 to 31. But the damage to Labor was irrevocable. Is the party going to be united after this? In the midst of the drama, one of the chief architects of the 2010 leadership coup quit Parliament. Hello, Ron. I, along with my colleagues, have had to make some very tough decisions over the past three years. Before he left, Mark Arbib went to see Kevin Rudd. He came round to my office, said, so do you admit that you got it wrong? He said, no, no. So within you know, 24 hours, it had been briefed out to the media by uh, our bib that uh, we'd had a reconciliation and a meeting. For God's sake. You know, you spin your way in, you spin your way out. Um, and uh, there goes the heart and soul of the New South Wales right. Mm. Off to casino land. The moral epicentre of that particular factional grouping. Mm. Was that too harsh? Sex and corruption scandals involving Labor MP Craig Thompson and the Speaker Peter Slipper ran for months. The AFP announced today that it had launched a formal investigation into fraud allegations involving the, the motion to ask him was defeated by one vote, but it's something of a hollow victory. There was just ongoing speculation about whether it was Peter Slipper, whether it was Craig Thompson. To be trapped in a, an endless discussion about prostitutes and credit cards and, and text messages uh, was very, very frustrating. Honourable members, the Speaker. In the previous year, Liberal National MP Peter Slipper had agreed to become Speaker of the House. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to... Ensuring a precious extra vote for the government. In a majority government, I would have had more options. I would not have uh, needed to make the arrangement with Peter Slipper. Clark. I would have had a freer hand with Craig Thompson. Mr Slipper is Julie oh, Gillard's still... man, just as Craig Thompson is her man. The Peter Slipper saga continues and, yes, continues and continues and continues. Thank you very much. It's getting worse. Yes. As the public mood against the two men hardened, Gillard was forced to act. Craig Thompson was suspended from the Labor Party, Peter Slipper from the Speakership. The papers that we woke up to the next day was the worst set of papers that I saw in the entire period of government. Uh, there was a very real sense at that point that the government could fall at any moment. In September, Julia Gillard travelled to Russia for the APEC conference. <laughs> for security uh, reasons, they changed over our mobile phones, so we were all struggling with these old Nokias. Um, and in a quiet moment, just before I was going to be swept into the motorcade, uh, I finally uh, worked out this Nokia well enough to realise that I had a message on it and to listen to the message. And the message was my sister saying to give her a call. Uh, and so I rang her back and she told me Dad had died. Uh, this was a profoundly distressing time in her life. In the life of the man, there is a moment to go gentle into that good night. And so it was. Thank you.
say in relation to the ABA. Broadcaster so Alan Jones turned Gillard's bereavement into another opportunity to abuse her. I just can't describe the horror of that. And uh, I, I don't understand how people can think that way and have that in their hearts. You know, there's so much hatred. And there was so much hatred for her being a female Labor Prime Minister. Will be another day of shame for this parliament, another day of shame for a government which should already have died of shame. The government is not dying of shame. My father did not die of shame. Yeah. It, it did shock me that, you know, anyone uh, would want to associate themselves with such a vicious act of cruelty as the one that Alan Jones had engaged in. It did seem to me, you know, like tomorrow you could wake up to anything and that there just are no rules anymore. Sparking the drama, text messages from Mr Slipper that have just come to light in the sexual harassment case brought against him by former staffer James Ashby. The case against Peter Slipper was later abandoned. But now its lurid details became part of a parliamentary numbers game. First, Madam Deputy Speaker, there are the truly gross references uh, to female genitalia. I regret to, to speak in this way to this House, but it is necessary, Madam Deputy Speaker, to prosecute uh, this matter. The opposition leader moved a motion of no confidence in the suspended Speaker. Well, I say to this Prime Minister, just as the Speaker has failed the character test, you, Prime Minister, are about to fail the judgment test. I call the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and I rise to oppose the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition. Gillard's response will forever be etched in the history of feminism. And in so doing, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, I will not be lectured about sexism and misogyny by this man. I will not. I was offended when the Leader of the Opposition went outside in the front of Parliament and stood next to a sign that said, ditch the witch. I was offended when the Leader of the Opposition stood next to a sign that described me as a man's bitch. I was offended by those things. Misogyny, sexism, every day from this Leader of the Opposition. I thought it was a uh, brilliant speech. She effectively named um, the then Leader of the Opposition. Uh, for what ultimately was his view of women. And I congratulate her on that speech. After the misogyny speech, it was, you know, gloves off, straight into the muck. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to... Her the opposition hit back at Gillard with allegations about her conduct as a union lawyer 20 years earlier is the reason she did not open a file that it would have alerted her partners and the AWU to the existence of an unauthorised slush fund. Uh, to the Deputy Leader's question, no, that's not the reason. It was routine to do small matters for unions without fees mm -hmm. and consequently didn't open a file. Where these conspiracy theories are getting us to is truly absurd and generally embarrassing. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. It's like when you're... Uh, when you're trying to tune a TV and the static's there the whole time. Uh, you know, I'll never forget National Press Club announcing that we'd finally signed off on a Murray-Darling Basin plan. Went to questions from the media. Could hardly get anyone to ask me a question about the reform. How much of that static was created by Kevin Rudd's attempts to return? A lot, but not all. Amidst the scandals, the Prime Minister pushed ahead with her biggest reform. It is time that Australia had a national disability insurance scheme. The system is unfair, it's underfunded, it's fragmented and it's inefficient, and we can do better. What gave birth to the National Disability Insurance Scheme was decades of campaigning by people with disabilities and people who cared for them. In that environment, 
knowing that this would be a reform of the size and scale of Medicare, as Prime Minister, I said, we're going to do this. Really Hello. <laughs> Hello. How's my mate? <laughs> How are you? You're Finding a way to present the real Julia had proved elusive. In the end, a simple photograph taken at an NDIS event by 12-year-old Sophie Dean seemed to capture a person the voters didn't see. Do you understand why she failed to get traction? Part of it, I think, may have been her own reaction or protective mechanism towards the volume of abuse uh, that was being poured upon her. By year's end, bad economic news added to the government's compounding woes. The federal government's incredible shrinking surplus looks set to disappear altogether. The Treasurer was forced to break an election promise to deliver a budget surplus. Obviously, dramatically lower tax revenue now makes it unlikely that there will be a surplus in 2012. The time before the government had to abandon their, their fetish about the surplus. And the fact is that, um, uh, that when you put a forecast out there, it, it eventually, one way or the other, is one that you get uh, nailed to. Uh, we got nailed to it. Uh, I accept responsibility for that. Combined revenue from the first two quarters of the MRRT totaled $126 million dollars. Hit by the resources slump, Julia Gillard's mining tax, secured in her first week in office, had failed to raise the promised billions in revenue. The biggest flaw in uh, getting it done as quickly as we did was the inability to settle the relationship between the minerals resource rent tax and state-based taxation royalties, and certainly uh, the our understanding of how that would work was not drafted uh, as clearly as it should be. An early mistake of the government. Inexperience, I suppose. Uh, urgency, explained by urgency and the political pressure that was around, but yes, clearly a mistake. Going into 2013, the numbers were diabolical in New South Wales. I sent the Prime Minister this research that says we're finished in Sydney. And, you know, Julia is a smart political operator. She realises that this is very, very politically powerful. And I get a phone call and I get invited to this private brunch at Kirribilli. He came to see me and to talk about uh, Western Sydney, I said, Prime Minister, we are losing the entire migrant vote in Sydney. This is us having no base. And she says to me, is this about Kevin? And I said to her, it isn't about Kevin, but it will become about Kevin. It was inconceivable to me that the kind of anti-Labor work that Kevin had been involved in, the destabilisation, the leaking, would be rewarded by the leadership. And Julia looks at me and says, you don't know him, Sam. You think you know him, but you don't know him. He's a wrecker. You can't reward a wrecker. She was saying in 2010, if we stick with Kevin, we'll lose an election and we might lose it badly. Well, if that's your rationale in 2010, you have to accept that in 2013, the same rationale might be used, but for a very different conclusion. Hello. How are you? Sensing the threat, Gillard's union backers tried to shore up her support. I don't know what magic thing we could have pulled in our pockets to save her by that stage. Um, I wanted to make it clear that our union was backing her. I'm sure it did not help electorally at all, but this is February 2013. Do you remember those polls? I remember those polls, <laughs> you know. The polls showed Labor facing a significant election loss. Hello? There was phone call after phone call, and there was a sense amongst the New South Wales Labor MPs how bad it was. But the Victorian Labor MPs were holding completely firm with Julia Gillard. They were sticking with her. And it was pretty much open warfare at that stage. No one was in any real doubt that there were two groups inside the party and that the group supporting 
uh, Kevin was growing. Oh, I made it known to Julia that um, she'd lost me. And were you leaking to the press? I wasn't leaking to the press, I was talking to the press. Any politician that says they don't constantly talk to, to journalists uh, off the record uh, is a lying politician. There aren't too many of those around, are they? <laughs> By now, even one of Gillard's political mentors was ready to switch sides. Simon Crean claims Rudd gave him an undertaking Rudd would challenge if a spill was called. Never in any doubt that if we were going to do it, that he would run. Never in any doubt. We had a broad discussion about leadership. But there was no particular resolution. We're thinking this is all for you. <laughs> Kevin came back from the meeting with Simon Crean and essentially come to the conclusion that Simon was a bit mad. Thanks for coming. Some people say that you are no longer in the Gillard camp and that you you are a supporter of Kevin Ruddy. Are you are you still a strong supporter of Julia Gillard? People say all sorts of things about me. I say to you, don't listen to them. He'd been uh, asked to support me as leader and failed to do so, so the hairs were already running. The same morning as the Labor leadership circus was setting up its tent, Julia Gillard had a solemn task to perform, a national apology to the victims of forced adoption. Today, this parliament, on behalf of the Australian people, takes responsibility and apologises for the policies and practices that forced the separation of mothers from their babies, of practices that were unethical, dishonest and in many cases illegal. We... Paul Howes had a personal involvement in the campaign for an apology. I was very angry about that day because there was a for me, it was a very important day, and for um, thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of um, mothers, fathers and children, it was a day that we'd been waiting for all of our lives. These mothers did nothing wrong. You loved your children and you always will. To have it um, waylaid with a crazy-ass kind of brain fart, just shut me to no end, um, to put it um, politely. I am asking her to call a spill of all leadership positions in the party. I will not be standing for the leader. I will be putting myself forward in the leadership team for the deputy leader. Gillard responded swiftly. Comments from Mr. Cream. I have determined that there will be a ballot for the leadership and deputy leadership of the Labor Party at 4.30 today. In the meantime, take your best shot. Crean's announcement had come too soon for Kevin Rudd's backers. <laughs> the fog of war. Alan Griffin and Kim Carr had independently had a look at the numbers and no matter which way you looked at it, Kevin was going to fall about five short. When I say that I would not challenge uh, for the Labor leadership, I believe in honouring my word. Kevin Rudd didn't nominate. The leadership ballot was uncontested. Gillard sacked Simon Crean from the ministry. I decided to resign and she has accepted my resignation. Seven Rudd backers, including three ministers, resigned. To offer my resignation, and the Prime Minister has chosen to accept it. Today, the leadership of our political party, the Labor Party, has been settled and settled in the most conclusive fashion possible. The whole business is completely at an end. It has ended now. No, I didn't think it was all over. With little time and dwindling political capital, Julia Gillard fought to secure her legacy in education and disability. It's likely the last major reform for the Gillard minority government. We are 
and I could hear the forces massing. So I was very, very keen uh, to make sure that I got our big reforms done before those forces could reach a critical point. Overwhelmingly supportive... The pressure on Julia Gillard was telling. Over the past six years, the idea of a national disability insurance scheme has found a place in our nation's hearts. But the voters were unmoved. The system should yeah, let Australians down. Uh, I... Full of it. Thanks. Labor's primary vote continued to slide. Men and women of Fairfield. Kevin Rudd focused his attention on the vulnerable seats in Western Sydney. But I remember thinking, yeah, <laughs> it's just like Jesus coming into Jerusalem. You know, this is, maybe this is just a bit too good. Gillard's support in her own state had held up till now. And what you suddenly had was the polling coming out of Victoria and the phones kept ringing. And it was the Victorians all of a sudden this time calling, saying, hey, it's bad down here. It's really, really bad. I had a conversation with Bill in Melbourne before the last parliamentary fortnight where he indicated to me he thought things were pretty dire. Did you feel betrayed by him at that point because he had been a very fervent backer, driver of the change of leadership in 2010? Uh, I understood he was going to make a, you know, different decision. Uh, yes, uh, in the moment you're disappointed. <laughs> And so the Labor government, bitterly divided, returned to Canberra for the final parliamentary session before the winter recess. I think I was the person who coined this phrase, the killing season. It was the last sitting fortnight before the election. Realistically, if there was to be a challenge, it would have to be in that sitting fortnight. <laughs> Politicians and journalists assembled for the midwinter ball. There was a French theme, and revolution was in the air. Kevin Rudd used the cover of the night for a secret meeting with Bill Shorten. Kevin makes an early exit from the midwinter ball and heads up to Richard Miles' office where Bill Shorten is. There's no way in the world I was going to move unless Bill Shorten and his group were going to come with me. Did Bill Shorten ask for anything in return? No, he didn't. Um, I asked for something. That prior to the election, we changed the rules of the party to prevent a leadership coup from ever happening again. I have carefully considered my position. I have now come to the view that Labor stands the best chance to defend the legacies of this term of government and to continue improving the lives of millions of Australians if Kevin Rudd is our leader. For the fourth time in three years, Labor MPs walked the gauntlet to a leadership contest. MPs and senators who had stampeded to Gillard's side in 2010 now switched their support back to Rudd. As you would probably be aware by now, Kevin Rudd has been elected as leader of the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party. It's a democratic process, guys. What became clear was that the parliament wasn't big enough or the caucus wasn't big enough for both Julia and Kevin. When, you know, the final uh, curtain came down, you know, I wasn't shocked or surprised. I am very proud of what this government has achieved, which will endure for the long term. I'm also very proud of uh, having commenced the Royal Commission into child sexual abuse in institutional settings. I want to just say a few remarks about being the first woman to serve in this position. It doesn't explain everything. It doesn't explain nothing. It explains some things. What I am absolutely confident of is it will be easier for the next woman 
and the woman after that, and the woman after that, and I'm proud of that. It is, for me, a truth that I do not get the slightest sense of satisfaction or joy about the discomfort of others. You've got to gather yourself, you've got to give the speech, go see the Governor General, do all of that. And then you get to have a few drinks with friends, so that's not that hard. Kevin Rudd lost the 2013 election, but was credited with saving up to 25 seats. Were you and Julia Gillard better together? Of course we were. And we were a very effective team. And I wanted her to succeed me. I really did. I don't see what alternate reality was possible other than the ones we lived through. So I think people are really, you know, wistfully hoping for something that was never going to be. The hard question that the Australian Labor Party has to ask itself is this. How is it possible that you win an election in November 2007 on the scale that you do, with the goodwill that you have, with the permission that you're gifted by the public? I want to thank my deputy, Julia Gillard. She has been fantastic as the deputy leader of the Australian Labor Party. She'll be fantastic as the deputy prime minister of Australia. Kevin's just done a remarkable job in the less than 12 months he's been leader and a remarkable job during the campaign. Great support. He's just, you know, amazing. Uh, and intellectual grasp, touch with the Australian community, you couldn't possibly ask for better. And you manage to lose all that goodwill, to trash the permission, and to find yourself out of office within just six years. I've never seen anything quite like it in any country, anywhere, any time, in any part of the world. No one can escape blame for that, in my view.